Hello Rovers! So today we are talking about composting toilets, dry composting toilets in particular. And just a little background on this, Mrs. Rover and I, we have used a version of this toilet several times over the last 25 years. We are, we are absolutely uh, very comfortable using this and it's a great solution if you are on an off-grid homestead or in an RV or living on a small boat. Now there are several designs out there, but I'm going to show you probably one of the simplest and because it's so simple, it's probably one of the most efficient of those dry composting toilets. So what is a dry composting toilet? Well, I'll tell you what it is. It, it has no moving parts. It uh, doesn't require any water. It's low cost. It, uh, and it's most important to, to Mrs. Rover and I, it is odorless. So, and after it's built, all you need to do is make your contribution and then Mother Nature will take care of the rest. So let's see what's involved in building one of these toilets. Now, a lot of you that are new to the channel, you may not know what my background is. So for the last 30 years, I've been a carpenter. And for 26 of those years, I've been a journeyman carpenter. And whenever I approach any building project whatsoever, the first thing I do is I create a sketch. So that's so important. You, you, it doesn't have to be complicated. It, it doesn't need a lot of measurements. It just needs to conceptualize what it is that you want to do. Now, the second thing you want to do is you want to create a drawing, an accurate drawing with dimensions, something that shows you all the different types of joints and the different types of material that you'll be using in the project. Again, this doesn't need to be overly complex as you can see from the drawing I did, but it's enough for you to move on to the third step, which is you have to have an accurate cutting list. So the cutting list goes into all the different pieces, their lengths, and the number that you need to have. Armed with these three items, I can almost guarantee you will be successful building whatever project you do. So now armed with this cutting list, let's head out to the saw and start building our project. So I'm in the, I'm in the workshop section of Rover's Rest right now. Now this is unheated, as you can probably see from my breath, but that's not going to stop us from accomplishing what it is we need to do, which is building that composting toilet. So in my hand, I have my sketch. I also have my drawing. And I have my cutting list. So I'm going to bring that cutting list out, put it on the top, because that's all we really need at this point. And in the most of it is made out of three quarter inch ply. But I also need some structural material. So I'm just using leftover two by material uh, from our build. Okay, so this is, this is weathered, but that's fine because you won't even see this. This is going to be inside the whole toilet. And it's really just for the structure. So I'm going to rip this. Now ripping is a carpentry term for whenever you make a cut that goes longitudinally with the grain as opposed to a cross cut, which goes across the grain. Now, whenever you do a ripping cut, you should put a ripping blade in your saw, which I have right here. And concerning safety, you want to make sure that your blade is sticking up no more than about a quarter inch above your stock. And you also want to make sure when the saw is running, you don't put your hand anywhere in this red zone. It's red for a reason. So if you find you have a narrow piece of wood you have to push through this saw, then you use a push stick. But if you can do it without putting your fingers in that red zone, you are safe. You also want to make sure that you don't have any dangly bits hanging from your wrist or arm. So in this case, I will be doing up my cuffs for safety, 
And you also want to make sure that your glasses are safety glasses, that is, and that you are wearing hearing protection. Apart from that, have fun building the project. Now that we've finished ripping the 2 by material, now, to now it's time to cross cut the plywood. And in order to do that, I'm going to use a cross cut blade. It's designed to do a much nicer job on plywood. And in particular, this plywood is a very good plywood. I, I didn't buy it specifically for this project. It was left over from another project. Anyway, if you don't have a good blade like this, that's fine. You can, you can continue to use maybe a multi-purpose blade and, and that'll, that'll do fine. So I'll install this and I'll show you some of the special things I do when I change blades. All right, so the first thing you wanna do is remove the throat plate. Just put it off to the side. Now we need to remove this blade. So you just take a scrap piece of wood in order for the blade to bite in. And that's all you need to do. Then take your wrench and it's just that easy. Remove the bolt, don't drop it. Uh, I just said remove the bolt but in fact what I meant to say was remove the nut. Now we don't need this blade, so we're going to put our nice finishing blade on. So you slide it over the arbor, put the washer on, and then go ahead and put the nut on the blade. Uh, put the nut on the arbor. Just need to hang on to the blade just with your thumb and forefingers, and that's enough to tighten it. All right, so if you don't have anything else, you can put this throat plate back on, but in fact, I have a special uh, throat plate that I've made that fits this blade really tightly. As you can see, the general purpose uh, throat plate has a pretty wide opening and that causes ripping of the fibers in the plywood. So we'll be using my special throat plate. I have to lower the blade for that. And then we just make sure there's no dust on the supports. Put it in. There you go, you're all set. Okay, so now we're getting ready to cut our ply. Now, when I look at our ply, I've got two pieces. One that's 40 inches long, one that's 56 inches long. Uh, neither of them are full pieces, they're only 42 inches tall. So I've looked at my pieces that I need to cut and I've placed them on a quick little drawing uh, to tell me how I can maximize my material. So, and second thing you want to notice is the height of the toilet is 16 and 3 eighths. So I have four pieces that must be done to the same height. So we'll cut all four of those before we change the saw. So it's good to look at your cutting list. It can tell you so much and really make your, make your work life really efficient once you know uh, the value of it. Okay, so now we have our fence set up at 16 and 3 eighths. Uh, last piece of advice, well, not the last, but the next piece of advice I want to give you is whatever, uh, whatever measurements you make for this project, use the same tape measure because there are little differences that you might find between tape measures which 
may occur just from the bending of the little clip on the end here. But anyway, as long as you use the same tape measure, you're going to end up with a pretty accurate result. So we've set this to 16 and 3 eighths. Let's start pushing the ply through. Another piece of advice I want to give you is always make sure that you have the good side up and the bad side of your ply or the lesser grade of your ply on the underside. That way when the blade spins, it spins this direction and it'll pull fibers on the underside of the plywood, but your finished side will still remain very sharp looking. Well, now that we've got all the ply cut, we can start attaching the structural members to the ply. So that'll go something like this. Now there's a few different ways we can do this. Of course we can um, use some glue on the structural members and then we can just use some two inch brad nails and that would be perfect and be very fast. And it's probably my preferred route other than it's too cold right now to operate my compressor. My compressor is getting a little old and uh, it just doesn't like these temperatures. So another perfectly viable way of doing this is to pre-drill uh, the ply and then use screws to go straight into the wood. You don't need to pre-drill this uh, wood because this is just structural wood, it's, uh, it's spruce and being a soft wood, uh, the screws will just bite into it all by themselves. So now I have taken uh, an opportunity to mark uh, little points here where I, I'll pre-drill and the reason that I pre-mark them is I want, I want this to look nice and by making sure that they're symmetrical uh, your finished product will look so much better. Alright, so time to get on with this. I'll just start screwing or I'll start pre-drilling these. So I neglected to mention that how do you know where to put these screw holes? Well, you've got to refer back to your building drawing again. So that's why we do all these drawings and you can see where the wood is going to be. So you'd screw, put screws through that piece, through this piece. You know, it's, it becomes obvious once you have a drawing. Now that the wood has been pre-drilled, it's time to start assembling the whole project. So we have our uh, pieces of uh, structural wood down here. So we just line this up and I know that this goes here because I just looked at the drawing. Now, it's a little cold so I'm wearing gloves. Uh, normally I wouldn't, which makes for, I think, better carpentry. You, you can feel better with your fingertips. Okay, now we're locked in. We're good for length. We're good to go. So just part, start putting screws in. Well, now that we have all the structural wood on the ply attached nice and firmly, we can start assembling the whole project. Okay, we're looking pretty good here.
make sure that you've got it tight and flush. Now, as you screw this together, this bottom piece is what actually holds the whole box nice and square. So this is why it's really important to follow the right sequence from your cutting list when you're cutting everything because when you cut the width of this side piece, you're also cutting the width of this bottom piece and everything will line up just right. So I'll just continue screwing this all together. Okay, so our box is almost complete. That's the lower section of the toilet, so everything's gone well so far. We just have to attach the final end. So when you go to do that, it'll be easier if you stand the box up on end and you get a lot more purchase with your driver. Go to the bottom, square it off. There we go. The box portion of our composting toilet is complete. Now what we need to do is fashion a top for it. which will be this piece. Goes this way. And then we'll be putting a toilet seat on it. So we need to make some measurements now that we have our box. Okay, so now we're going to fit the top. So the first thing we want to do is make sure that the top is placed evenly with an even margin all the way around. So just using a ruler to set that up. And we're looking really good. And as soon as you've got it centered on the box, then take your pencil and scribe a line all the way around. So now that you've put a line all the way around, let's take a look at what we have. So now that we have our perimeter of the box lined up on the top, we place the toilet seat. Now this is the underside of the seat. So we can make lines here and not worry about it. So I've already scribed this line, so with a pencil you should be doing the same thing. And then we remove it and we have our toilet seat superimposed over top of the box. The next step is to line up where we'll cut the hole for the bucket. And to do that, I've simply grabbed the lid from the bucket and I've placed it on and I've checked the margins and I'm happy with the space and this is where I've scribed around the edge of this circle giving me this line right here. That's the space we are going to remove. We're going to cut this piece out of the top. We're also going to cut a hole so that we can secure the toilet seat to the top. All right, we'll do this. We'll drill a hole through the edge of this and then we'll use our jigsaw to cut all the way around. Okay, so now we have the area where the 
bucket will go and I've actually made the line an eighth of an inch bigger all the way around to make sure that if the bucket isn't perfectly round it'll still fit. So I'm going to drill a hole and I'm not going to drill it at the edge of that line but a little distance in just in case there's a little bit of tear up. All right, after the hole has been drilled, now we can go get the jigsaw. Now with the jigsaw, Now that we have successfully cut the hole out of the top, it's now time to drill these holes for the toilet seat. Uh, step one, whenever you go to drill a big hole, always use a center punch or an awl and make a little depression so that the drill bit, the drill bit won't wander and it will actually cut in the hole. So I'll do that right now. The other piece of advice when drilling holes is always have a sacrificial piece underneath the wood you're working on. That will cause less fiber breakout on the underside. So the next step is to secure four little corner blocks on the underside of the seat and that will keep the seat from shifting on the top of the box. So we'll just get these on here. Okay, so let's do a test fit. Okay, that's great. That's great. So now we can secure the toilet seat to the box. So here we have our toilet totally assembled. The seat is nice and secure. Now if you built it right, there should only be about three-eighths of an inch between the top of this bucket and the top of the ply. The seat itself has this little rim that goes around both the outside and inside. So when it's closed down, really it, uh, there's very little distance between the bucket and the bottom of the seat, and that's what you want. Well, now that we've finished building the toilet, let's see how it works. Now, how to get the most out of your dry composting toilet. So in our case, we use peat moss as a medium. Now, you can use sawdust. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's just really convenient for us to buy a bale of peat moss. It's not expensive. We put about an inch of peat moss in the bottom of the bucket. Now it's really important that whatever medium you use, it has to be dry. Next, after you've made a contribution, cover it with a layer of peat moss. The peat moss absorbs the liquids and dries out the solids. The end result? No odors. Now, if you do have odors, you're going to have to play around with how much dry peat moss you put in. When the bucket is about half to two-thirds full, remove it and replace it with a fresh bucket. Empty the original bucket into a dedicated composting toilet-only compost pile. In summer, when you do this, cover the pile in straw and this will prevent the rich compost from sprouting opportunistic seeds, plants, and whatever. Now, once the compost pile is full, let it rest for about a year. And if you are on medications, let it rest for two years. And then use it on your fruit trees or your flower garden. So as I said at the beginning, 
This kind of toilet, this dry composting toilet, is something that Mrs. Rover and I have used successfully several times over the last couple of decades. Now, most important to us, it doesn't have any odor. And, unlike a regular flush toilet, you're not using fresh drinking water to flush everything away. Ironically, the compost from this toilet is like rocket fuel for your fruit trees and roses. Yoo-hoo! Mr. Rover, could you pass the toilet paper, please? Of course, my dear. <laughs> now, the best way that you can help Rover's Rest is by sharing our videos on your social media. And remember, it's always free to subscribe.